Hi. This class, this lecture, this video, I'm going to introduce you to a concept that we're going to be dealing with for most of the rest of this course, um, which is objects. Um, so this is a really important thing for you to understand. And in, on the day that uh, corresponding to this video, I'm going to do lots of examples of this in class and so on. But this is a very, very, very important concept. And so here's the outline of what I'm going to cover today is going to introduce the concepts of objects and classes, concepts of class members, and also how do you, how do you create new objects um, and use them? What is an object? Um, so the way to view the world, if you're doing object oriented things, is you think about every object in terms of what is that object's state? So what are the properties of that object? And what is that object's behavior? What are some of the things it can do? So for example, this picture here is um, to do with perhaps there's a bicycle. And so some, uh, some aspects of the state are what gear is the bike in? What's, what cadence is the person pedaling with? Um, what speed is the bike going? Those are some aspects of the state of a bicycle. And then there are some behaviors you can actually either the bicycle can do or things you can do to the bicycle. So for example, you can change gears, you could brake, the rider could change their cadence to pedal faster or slower. So the, the way to view the world if you're doing this object oriented thing is every object, everything in the world has state, what are its properties and behavior, what things you can do that maybe modify aspects of that state. So why would you want to program like this? Um, why program with objects? Um, if you've done first year here in Glasgow, you've spent a year programming basically without objects. Why would you suddenly need to use objects? Several reasons um, why object-oriented programming is a useful way to think about the world. One is in terms of modularity. So in terms of maybe you want to, um, and this, Modularity can interact with pluggability in the sense that maybe you want to model a bicycle as kind of a module, as a separate component, and make sure that you've modeled that bicycle and all the states of the bicycle and all the behaviors of the bicycle, and that's all there. And you keep all the code to do with bicycles separate from the code to do with, um, I don't know, shoes or, or other, other sorts of vehicles. You keep all that stuff in one package. Um, and then that means if you've got kind of, here's a blob that is just the bicycle, then you from the outside, if you're using that bicycle object or you're using that object to do whatever, you don't need to know what's going on inside it. You just need to know what are the properties of this thing that I might need to know about, what behaviors can I ask this thing to do? So, I mean, when you're riding a bicycle, when I'm riding a bicycle, I'm able to change gears without understanding every nuance of exactly what the lever does and how the chain moves. I just know, here's a bike. Somebody else has tested it. Somebody else has put it together. I want to change gears. I just do the change gear action. Stuff happens. But I don't need to know the details. It hides that from me. In terms of coding as well, if you've got a good representation of some object, Maybe that's an object you want to use in multiple places in your code. So if you have a representation of, say, a web page, um, maybe you're doing you're doing writing one piece of code where you need to represent a web page and, and do behaviors on that page. Maybe you're writing something different where it's doing some different behavior, but you still need to have a representation of the web page. You can use that exact um, modular representation of that web page and just stick it into your new piece of code and know that it, you know, if it worked, you know, it's, it still represents a web page. You can still do all the behaviors you could do on it here. You don't need to rewrite that part of your code. So in terms of terminology, um, you know, there's the word class and the word, there's the word object. And this kind of maps to the stuff we've been talking about in a lot of previous videos and lectures to do with types um, in terms of, so if you think of class as something like int and an object is something like an actual number five. So a class is a type, just like int is a type, just like string or one dimensional array of booleans is a type. And an object is an instance of that type. That's what these words mean in terms of object-oriented programming. So a class you can think of as a blueprint 
of you know generally describing how objects are created and then an object is an instance of a general class of objects so you know the example that we've seen before is the boolean primitive type has only two possible instance values it can be either true or false if you imagine a dog class then maybe the instances of that class could be Toto, Lassie, Brian, Griffin, Scooby-Doo, any other dogs you can think of. That's how, that's what the distinction is between classes and objects. Two other terms that uh, are often used in the word of object-oriented programming are abstraction and encapsulation. So on the one hand, what abstraction means is that the class is an abstract description of a set of real world entities. So it's not that if you define a dog class, it's not that the dog class is a dog, it's that the dog class somehow represents the important properties of a dog. So that's what abstraction means, is you take this actual real world entity and you decide what are the actual important behaviors and um, properties that I need to represent, and you represent just those. And encapsulation, what that means, every instance of a class has data, has properties, and it ha and has behavior associated with it. It's all together in one bundle. Um, so that's object-oriented programming in general. Specifically in Java, let's talk about how you would actually, if you want to define an object, if you, uh, terminology, if you want to define a class, how do you actually define a class in Java? And not surprisingly, the, the way you do it syntactically, what you need to actually write is the word class. So if you wanted to find a class for a dog, you need to give that class a name. Maybe you would call it dog. I'll have an example on the next slide. So you define, you say, you're going to define a class. You're going to define, here is my representation. Here is my abstraction of something that I need to represent in my program. You give it a name. You say, what are the fields? You know, what are the properties? And then you define the methods which define the behavior of that object, of, of objects of that class. You can also add other things, and we'll come to those later in the course, things like access modifiers, superclasses, interfaces. We'll come to those later in the course. But at the core, when you're defining a class, when you're defining an abstraction of some real world entity, you need to give it a name, you need to say what are the properties, and you need to say what are the behaviors. So let's say we want to represent a simple bank account. So the way we define that in Java is we say we're defining a class, we give it the name bank account. And maybe if you define a bank account in a very simple way, it's got a balance, how much money is there in it, and what's the name of the person who, who the bank account holder. And then some two things you might want to, so those are the properties of a bank account. And then the behaviors, the things you want to do with the bank account are Maybe you want to deposit money into it, in which case here is one method, a deposit method, and you, or you might want to withdraw money from it. So, and these methods look like the methods we've been working with over the, since the start of the course. It's just these methods are now not defined at the top level. These methods are defined inside this, this class here. And, but you, you define the body of a method it, it looks the same, you declare it in the same way, but it just lives inside a class. So those are the fields of this class, and those are the methods of this class. And one thing to note here is these, the, the methods are actually able to refer to the fields of the class. So these fields are, um, in terms of scope, these fields are in scope for every method inside the class. So we've declared a field called balance, and that means we can use this field balance inside any of the methods of the class. I'll talk about why it says this.balance in a bit. So in terms of fields, um, the, the, the things together, fields and methods together are called class members. So the fields are, they store the state that represents some attribute of the object. With a bank account, it's the balance and the name of the account holder. If you represent a dog, it might have a name and a breed and a size and an age. And the methods represent behavior that processes and transforms the object state. For the bank account, it's deposit and withdraw. For the dog, there might be methods like eat and sleep and go for a walk. And one special method you, you might see is if you declare a method that has this exact signature, including these, these two words at the front, public and static, that I haven't really gone into yet, um, 
then if a class has a main method, then you can actually run that class directly as a program. Um, and I'll when I when I do the lecture according to this video, I'll show you how that works, what that means in practice. And just to remind you, here's what Java methods look like. We've, we've dealt with methods before. Methods that are part of a class work exactly the same as methods that aren't part of a class, except that inside the, the method, there's you can use the fields. The fields are also in scope, but this is not new. I've shown this slide a couple times before in terms of what Java methods look like. In terms of fields in a, in a class, so what are fields? We've already, you know, they're another type of variable. We've already seen local variables. These are variables uh, declared inside a method. In, in, the, in the Java program we've done so far, you can declare variables inside a method, and we've seen that. Um, you can have parameters of a method. We've seen that as well. We've worked with methods for a while. Member variables in a class are known as fields. So in a class, they look like um, they look like normal declarations that you have a type, you have a value, you have a type, you have a name, you might give it an initial value, you can change that value. Um, but the difference is that there, if you declare a field inside a class, then it's also in scope for all methods of that class, as in the um, bank account class. We're just looking again, again at the bank account class. So we have these fields, and inside the method, you can use these fields. But if you look closely at this version of the class, something else has happened here. So here's the fields that we saw before. Here's the methods that we saw before. And then there's this thing down at the bottom. What is this thing? It looks like a method. It looks like a method that I've uh, made a mistake on, though, because I've been telling you and you've been finding out that you have to always specify a return type for a method. This looks like a method with no return type. What this thing is is called a constructor. And you might notice that this weird method without a return type has exactly the same name as the class, and that's not a coincidence. What a constructor is, what it looks like, is a method with the same name as the class. Um, it's, and it's a method with the same name as a class that has no return type specified, not even void, you don't put anything. And what a constructor does is it actually, you can use that to set up the initial values for any of the fields. This is how you set up the object state. And if you use this keyword here, what that means is you're referring to the object being um, created. So when you say things like this.name, if you look inside here, you've got a parameter called name and you've got a field called name. So this is a, a case where this is actually okay, but you want to specify which, which, which of these two name variables you actually want. So when you do something like this, say this.name equals name, this.name means the name field, name means the parameter. And the same thing here, this dot balance equals initial amount. So this dot whatever means you're referring to a field inside, inside the, the object. So, and when, when you have a constructor defined like this, then you're allowed, that's how you create new objects of this class. So the bank account we've defined here has a constructor the constructor has two parameters, which are a string for the name and a number and an int for the balance. What that means is we're able to create, you know, you declare a variable the same way you declare any other variable. You give it a name the same way you give it any other name. And the way you initialize this variable is you say, use this word new, and then you say bank account, and then you give it the parameters. And then B is then a bank account object. That's how that if you declare if you created a class and you want to make an object of the class, you use the new, the new method, and you use the constructor to create it. And if you don't specify any constructors, Java will still automatically generate a constructor for you um, that will initialize the fields to their default values. Um, so in this case, it'll it would be the, the the name would be null and the balance would be zero. So if you have an object and you want to call methods on it, so first you need to create an instance of the class. So here we say bank account, we have my account, and then we create a new object of that type using the constructor. So now my account is a bank account object. So then if we want to call methods on it, this is the way you do it. You say the variable name and a dot, then you call the method name with its parameters. 
So in this case, if we want to deposit 500 pounds into this account, we would say my account dot deposit 500. And then that would call the deposit method with the value 500 and it would add it would add 500 to the balance. Then if we call my account dot withdraw 250 on this exact object, it would call the withdraw method with and subtract 250 from the balance. So that's the basics of object oriented programming in terms of what is an object, what is a class, how do you define a class in Java, how do you create an object of that class, and how do you do stuff with it. That's it for this video.